as, as, as most of you know, the uh, financial industry has, uh, in my view, actually largely become a technology industry. And I think we have a, a, a good example of, of, of uh, just, just how much that's the case uh, in our next speaker. So Randy Seff is a co-founder and CEO, CIO of Alpha Genius Technologies. Alpha Genius is a technology and investment management company that captures and processes proprietary behavioral sentiment, leading indicator, and company industry trend data from social web sources such as Twitter, Facebook, and blogs. Uh, Randy has built technology companies since he was 23 years old. Previous to Alpha Genius, uh, Randy co-founded iPhone gaming company Jerbo Inc. Uh, previous to that, Randy was co-founder and CEO of Media Defender. Randy has been interviewed on 60 Minutes, CBS Evening News, The Wall Street Journal, and The Financial Times. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Randy Seth. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear okay in the back? Good. All right. So, uh, quick background on us. Uh, Alpha Genius is a uh, quantitative hedge fund. We also do financial accounts. Uh, we've got a quick background that we use a uh, proprietary uh, data source uh, like Twitter, and Facebook, and blogs. We run them through machine learning algorithms to create investing models. Um, how many, just to kind of get a, a, a sense of the room, uh, how many people use Twitter for uh, any sort of investing research? Um, okay, how many people in the room are skeptical about the use of Twitter for any sort of uh, investment research? Okay. Uh, how many people in the room use any machine learning uh, in their data analysis? Okay. That's, that's actually impressive, a lot more than I usually see. Uh, how many people in them are skeptical about machine learning as a data analysis tool? Okay. Yeah, the choice. So, okay, so, you know, the balance is uh, shifted over time, I think. So, it seems like less people are skeptical about machine learning, still a lot of people are skeptical about the, uh, the Twitter stuff. So, I'll uh, try and convince everybody to agree on everything by the end. Um, so, uh, like uh, uh, we were introduced, uh, we've had two software companies. Um, Media Defender and uh, Jervo. Um, we've exited them for $65 million. Um, Jervo was just one of the first iPhone video game companies. We were just picked the right horse. It was a fun, fun ride. Uh, Media Defender was our, our more substantial company. Uh, and, and Media Defender was an anti piracy company, but we had a real neat little side business where we would take data on peer to peer networks uh, like LimeWire, and Kazaa, and Napster, if any of these names ring a bell. And we would actually run the, an, a statistical analysis on this data to predict music sales, and then we would sell that back to the music industry. Um, so that kind of whetted our appetite for predictive analytics and you know, using uh, the, the crowdsourcing, so to speak, to predict where sales are. Because I don't know if everybody knows this, but usually things were pirated months before they were available in stores. Uh, and then we did the same thing for the movie industry as well. So when we sold Media Defender in 2005, we decided to start collecting data on other sources at the time. Uh, the big ones we were focused on were blogs and forums. And we were really thinking around uh, consumer packaged goods companies, uh, consumer facing companies, and probably creating a marketing product uh, that we'd sell to maybe marketing companies or a product for example. Uh, we, we started collecting this data, and you know, we were just kind of collecting the data. We started the iPhone company, did that. And so uh, around 2009, we went back to our data that we'd been collecting. And we said, well, what do we want to do with this data? And around the same time, I got reacquainted with one of my best friends from college, uh, this guy Paul Tetlock, uh, who's a professor at Columbia Business School. Um, and he did a lot of the seminal research on how new sentiment affects the stock market and how the stock market affects new sentiment. Now, I'm not talking about event-based stuff. I'm talking about the actual sentiment, more of a, a psychological uh, uh, approach to uh, news. And what he discovered in his research is that there's a statistical uh, correlation between negative news events in the stock market, and the actual negative news affects the stock market, and then there's somewhat of a reversion of the mean after a few days. Uh, and, and his work's really well cited, and I encourage anybody who's interested in this topic to start there um, you know, with his research. So I, I talked to him about our data source, and I said, do you think our data, being blogs and forums and Twitter, uh, would apply to the news? 
and or, you know your, your research on the news. And now he used you know 30 or 40 years, years of Dow Jones Newswire. I mean, it was kind of his data source was beyond uh, question. You know, the, he kind of went into this uh, his research with a, a very robust data source. And he's like, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the same theories would apply. I mean, it's psychology and humans, but I mean, your data uh, timeline is so short. You know, you're only dealing with a you know few years of data here. Uh, so it really would be useful for me because it's not really past peer review when I'm already, you know, have been reviewed by efficient market guys who are already highly skeptical that uh, this stuff works. So we kind of took a step back, used his research as a uh, peppercorn to start our research, and we thought, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll sell this data to hedge funds. So we started building models and going meeting with hedge funds, and we found a lot of hedge funds just didn't really know what to do with this data. Um, we were a little surprised. We kind of thought that we would just dump the data on them and they would say, oh, you know, this fits perfectly into my model over here. Um, and we learned a lot about what most quantitative hedge funds are doing. And, you know, again, we're not from the industry, so it was uh, quite an early lesson. So we continued to turn the screw on the, on the uh, building the models and being computer scientists, machine learning was the natural place for us to attack this problem. So we kept turning the screw on the machine learning thinking we'll squeeze out one or 2% of alpha on each of these models. And if somebody wants to trade Apple or somebody wants to trade gold or somebody wants to trade oil, we'll sell them the models. Eventually we kept turning the screw and it got good enough that we decided to start live trading uh, last September and actually launch a hedge fund ourselves. So the sacred cows of efficient uh, of investing, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because everybody's familiar, but uh, for non-finance conferences, this is a you know useful to remind everybody that 85% of all investing involves either the efficient market hypothesis or uh, fundamental investing. Uh, ours is wholly outside of these two realms. I mean, we're not using any you know, traditional price earnings or you know, the, the traditional things that go into uh, a fundamental analysis. Uh, there's no statistical arbitrage, there's no uh, event-based um, investing. So. Our unique approach, uh, this is uh, you know, just a little visualization. We'll, we'll capture data from the social web, um, you know, really focused on sentiment. So where we start with is psychology dictionaries. So, you know, one of the things to think about this field is it's a convergence of many different fields. It's a convergence of behavioral economics, it's a, convergen a convergence of, of uh, machine learning, and it's a convergence of the social internet. So, you know, we start uh, with, uh, you know, these psychology dictionaries, much like Paul's research, uh, combine it with, you know, things, words, you know, phrases on the, uh, on the social web that we think are important, and that also that our, our, um, our computer software has actually pulled out that are important. So you find affinity terms, affinity phrases, and things like that. Uh, the data is processed using statistics and machine learning algorithms, and the output is quantitative trading models uh, that are, are traded. These models are, right now, we've started with uh, large cap securities uh, and commodities, uh, currencies, and bonds, uh, which we're trading ETFs on. The reason we chose to start with large cap securities and ETFs is because we wanted to keep the degrees of freedom pretty, pretty nominal. There's already a lot of degrees of freedom in a new system like this, and we wanted to make sure everything was really liquid, and that we weren't, uh, you know, trading sort of crazy derivative that we didn't understand. So, for those who are familiar with Twitter, uh, ignore the slide. But for those who are don't uh, completely, you know, haven't seen what people do on Twitter, uh, one of the things that's uh, you know, becoming more popular, uh, and it was referenced earlier in the conference, uh, is people will put dollar signs in front of ticker symbols when they actually talk about a stock. Uh, and it's becoming more and more important uh, as, you know, the shift from, you know, forums to blogs to the social internet in terms of how uh, crowdsourcing of, uh, of retail stock investors are actually trading and then sharing information with each other. So you can see here that, uh, ah, iPad 3, rumor season, getting full swing. So, you know, these are terms that, you know, uh, without even really, you know, running through machine learning, you can kind of use your human intuition, see a term like full swing, and the uh, the ticker symbol is probably a pretty uh, bullish term. You see patent infringement is probably a pretty bearish term. Uh, value has grown. Uh, you know, Apple's a great one because Apple just, you know, people, you know, churn on this stock all day. I mean, people love to talk about Apple. Uh, so for obvious reasons, it's a good uh, it's a good example. So what we'll do is we'll take these we'll take these actual terms and run it all through machine learning and you know, while, while I can do this kind of with 10, you know, 10 tweets on a page and kind of maybe get a feel, it's not very useful for actual investing. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll run it through our machine learning. And these machine learning uh, algorithms are actually taking in hundreds of inputs, which is why I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with them as, as, a, uh, as a tool for actual uh, investing. 
but what our outputs will be will be the you know basically the number of tweets in a day and a percent bullish, a percent bearish, and a percent neutral, and they'll just give us a call, sell short, buy long, or no call. So about a third of our calls are no calls. So we don't actually trade every day, everything. So why now? Like I said before, there's a convergence of a couple important fields here. Uh, is everybody in the room familiar with behavioral economics, more or less? Yeah, OK. So you know, behavioral economics is pretty well understood and accepted on a micro level. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, great book. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have read, it, read his work before. Uh, a lot of stuff has even become common sense now that people anchor to numbers. You know, if somebody buys a house in 2006 for $300,000, they will not sell that house for $1 less than $300,000. Uh, another classic one is people have loss aversion. People feel, uh, feel the pain of loss a lot more than they feel the pleasure of gain. It's approximately three times as much. Um, so a lot of these psychology experiments have been done in a laboratory environment or with surveys. So you'll get two or three people in a room and you'll you know, run some sort of thought experiment with them and they'll end up agreeing to buy a thermos or something above what the market would say, thus proving that each person is not a rational automaton. Then an efficient market guy will come back and say, well, yeah, but in general, we're all efficient automatons. Um, so what really hasn't been done a lot is macro group level behavioral economics. And part of that's because it's, it's kind of a lot harder to do uh, than the individual uh, studies of people in a room. And because behavioral economics was really uh, uh, founded by psychologists and not from economists, uh, the tools of uh, you know, so, you know, doing big group level uh, thought you know, really wasn't in, in the psychology realm. So Paul, my friend Paul at Columbia, you know, he's doing this type of stuff. News is a great place to start with sentiment. Um, but what we now have is also Twitter and Facebook, right? So while news is a great sentiment of reporters, and I think it's an important place to get sentiment, we certainly are, you use it, uh, Twitter and Facebook are more interesting to me because that's, for the first time in human history, you have a, uh, the entire, you know, a statistically relevant sampling of the entire world blasting what they feel at any one time. If they're happy, if they're sad, if they're optimistic, if they're pessimistic. So uh, you know, this is an exciting, uh, I think, convergence of behavioral economics and you know, the internet, basically. So people are familiar with Moore's law, but Kreider's law is more important for us. Kreider's law states that the magnetic disk aerial storage density doubles every 18 months, analogous to Moore's law. Um, so processing power was, has been here for a long time. And you, know, people, you hear the buzz term big data, big data, big data. Um, but the processing power has been here for big data. It's really the, the idea of storing all your data and even storing it when you're not sure what you're going to do with it. And again, we've kind of reached a tipping point in technology where you don't really ever have to throw anything away if you're a, if you're a hedge fund or a company. So even if you don't know what you're going to do with that big, giant data source, you can just keep it. The key to all of this, though, is artificial intelligence is now uh, good at narrow problems. Uh, artificial intelligence is truly one of the only fields of, of math and computer science that is actually increasing in, um, in uh, knowledge every, every single year. You know, every year, the, uh, the breakthroughs in, in artificial intelligence. So we just, like, I mean, it's kind of hard to believe, but it, you know, because math seems so like vetted. But only in the last, really, 10 years has artificial intelligence kind of crossed a threshold where it's even useful for a problem like this. Uh, original AI got a really bad reputation because it was trying to solve very, very broad problems. Um, and, so, and so, you know, just kind of Walk, it, walk through this. This is kind of what people thought AI would look like, you know, 50 years ago. You know, HAL 9000, data from Star Trek, or the seductress from Battlestar Galactica. So they thought it was a very ego, it was a very egocentric view of a of a machine. That you were going to actually be communicating with it, and you're going to be having a natural conversation with it. These problems were too big, huge disasters, things that we took for granted that a human can do, like facial recognition and uh, speech recognition. Uh, computers were really bad at, and that was a real boggling situation because in the in the 60s and 70s, computers were advancing so fast, and they were solving these huge calculus problems that humans couldn't do very you know very easily, uh, and it just seemed very logical that well if a baby can recognize a face, we can make a computer recognize a face. Well, it turned out it couldn't, and what AI ended up looking like was you know computer board games, so like checkers and chess, which we've all seen uh, have been around for quite a while. What AI is starting to look like, uh, really through through machine learning is Siri on your iPhone, Watson uh, winning Jeopardy, and my favorite, the uh, Google autonomous driving car. It's my favorite because I'm from Los Angeles and I hate driving. So the, the, the ushering in of this was really the effort to take artificial intelligence from solving these giant problems like face recognition, which is 
and the natural language, which is just too broad a problem, and bring it down to a very simple problem through letting the computer basically uh, trial and error its on its own, on its own uh, time. So to kind of take it back to the board game example, because I think it's the simplest example to understand, the original way a computer taught itself how to play checkers is it basically took the computer and let it play against itself. And it let it play against itself like a, like a seven-year-old would. There was no uh, constructs put into the computer of like, here's the generalization of how you play checkers. And it would, you know, it would make just dumb moves and it would go, and, and so this kind of blew people's mind because people originally, uh, when they thought about computers, they thought about expert systems. They thought, and then anybody's taking a computer science class, you learn if then, if then, if then. You make some sort of decision tree. Uh, and that's a very logical way for humans to think about train, you know, training a computer. So these expert systems were all these if-thens. Turns out for like a game like tic-tac-toe, that's fine. Because tic-tac-toe, there's a perfect game. It's a mathematically easy uh, thing to prove. You find that out actually when you're a little kid, you play your first perfect game of tic-tac-toe. Checkers has a theoretical perfect game as well. A game like chess has a theoretical perfect game mathematically, but it's, well, we would never get there as you know, humans trying to think through it because the decision tree just becomes too intractable too fast. Um, but by letting the computer play against itself, a computer would learn and just store what worked. Uh, and what a computer has that humans don't have is infinite time, right? A computer can just play millions and millions and millions of games against itself. So, um, you know, what this brought, what that's ushered in is basically instead of machine, instead of artificial intelligence being giving instructions to the computer, it's letting the computer learn through trial and error. So, uh, 54 years ago, artificial intelligence pioneer Herbert Simon declared that there will be a computer that now world machines that think and predict the computer will be chess champion in 10 years. And I'm taking 40 years, so obviously, you know, a real shock to the, the, the science. And now that it's focusing on narrow systems, expert systems are becoming less important. <clears throat> and, you know, I think that there's been a couple big, you know, events, you know, that have kind of turned people's minds on artificial intelligence, and definitely Watson winning uh, Jeopardy was a big one. And now, you know, I told my wife, Watson, a computer won Jeopardy. And she's like, well, of course a computer won Jeopardy. It has, you know, it's a computer. I mean, you can put all the information in it, right? And I was like, no, the, the challenge there is that Jeopardy has a lot of uh, tricky questions, a lot of double entendres, a lot of uh, ironies, you know, a lot of analogies. And it's not just a matter of knowing uh, what's the biggest country in the world. It's a matter of knowing, you know, uh, you know this president likes to, you know, da, da, da. And, and, and so the nature of a computer learning enough linguistics to actually understand things like irony, a big step forward. And actually, uh, it just happened today, which was a big deal for me, but may not be a big deal for anybody else, is uh, Google had a big breakthrough in that they, uh, they taught a computer, a big neural network of uh, 16,000 processors to recognize a cat. And the reason it was a big breakthrough is because they didn't tell it what a cat was. So, you know, we oftentimes refer to a supervised machine learning as you kind of know what the proper outcome should be and you're able to tell the computer right or wrong. In this scenario, they didn't even give any uh, example uh, of what a cat was and the computer was able to become self-aware of there is a thing that looks like this and I can identify it and we'll call it a cat. So, there's, you know, this stuff is just, again, exponential growth in, uh, in, uh, in the science of it. So, this raises interesting questions about the role of the person uh, and the experts in particular in many fields like science and doctors, wine critics, sports recruiters, and investors. So there's obviously, uh, you know, at a lot of these quant conferences, there's a man versus machine battle. And usually the man wins the argument because he's more charismatic than whoever's defending the machine side. But, you know, the reality is, is you know, whoops, um, you know, like all of these fields, you know, including medicine, you know, some, you know, pilots, you know, all these fields where there's kind of this feeling that a human could never be replaced by a machine. Um, you know, that's, I think that, that, is, that is happening, you know, a little quicker than people expect. And in particular, investing is, you know, when there's going to be a, a big, vigorous debate, I think, over the next decade about, you know, can a machine do what Warren Buffett does? And of course, there's a huge camp that will say, oh, no, I mean, a machine could never understand all the complexities that Warren Buffett can understand. Again, the science is moving pretty fast. So, uh, you know, I like to point out that at one point in human history, the role of the loan officer was very prestigious. Uh, there was a point in human history where the loan officer had to look the guy in the eye and say, I think he's trustworthy. Uh, and that's obviously, uh, it's all done via statistics now, and it's not a very prestigious job anymore. 
Uh, computers are not good at forming the questions or dealing with unexpected situations. So for example, if aliens landed on the Google car or somebody started shooting at the Google car while it's trying to autonomously drive through LA, it wouldn't know how to, what to do because it can't generalize like a human can. You know, again, we don't really fully understand how the human brain works, but we're tremendously good at generalizing, uh, you know, recognizing people are sad or happy or, uh, you know, even if we've never met the person before. And if something, you know, unexpected starts happening, we kind of uh, draw analogies to other parts of our life. Computers are not very good at that at all. So we see it as the human's role evolves from the expert in the, in the particular field to an expert data collector and hypothesizer. So there's some glaring problems with sentiment-based AI for investing. Uh, one is there's, there's a ton of data, but not long time series. This is what it is, uh, you know, and, and, uh, 10 years from now, you know, hopefully we'll have enough time series that will, uh, that, that debate will be over. I am thankful though that this time series was, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, <laughs> you know, these are, it, you know, for not being a long time series, these have been a really, really interesting time series from an investing standpoint. Uh, so I kind of back out of, uh, if this was like the secular bull market in the 90s and I was coming up here telling you I found a uh, machine learning sentiment based thing that worked, then well, it's like, well, everything's working, the bull, bull market, uh, or if it was a secular bear market. But this has been a, a tremendously choppy market. I mean, it's been up, down, uh, all over the place since there. So I have a lot more faith in our you know, five or six years of, uh, of testing than I would otherwise. Um, so, you know, we still feel that the role of the human to apply economics and psychological sense is key, uh, but it could be completely eliminated over time. So, you know, we still do vet our index. We call them indexes, our inputs. Uh, we still vet them, but we see over time that they could, uh, that the role could be, of the human could be uh, eliminated, but not for a long time. So statistics versus AI. Uh, I have 10 minutes left, so I'll kind of take my battles here. But uh, the good thing about statistics is, you know, it's pretty vetted. Nobody really questions. Uh, Statistics. My favorite part about statistics and, and these types of problems, it's a lot faster and cheaper than AI for, for hashing through problems. So one real downside of AI is if you're looking for relationships on your new orthogonal data source and you're plugging each one into your artificial intelligence system and you're waiting like you know seven or eight hours or maybe even a week, you come back and you can't even forget your train of thought, you know, what your, your thesis was. So statistics is good for hashing through a lot of relationships that may not be investable in of themselves, but you find the relationships. So artificial intelligence um, can deal with hundreds of factors. And this is the key, you know, especially when you're talking about something like natural language processing. Uh, the human language is infinitely extensible, plus we have dozens and dozens of data sources. So as you're feeding all these data sources in with hundreds of different phrases, uh, you need something that can take in hundreds of, of uh, inputs. And statistics just can't do it. I mean, you know, it starts to, it starts to become too complicated after you, know, you get past 10 or 12 factors. We'll have you know, three, 300, 500 factors. Uh, an obvious negative, negative is uh, uh, convergence and overtraining, and that's you know that's probably the biggest negative is, is this concept of overtraining. Um, now that's a that is a, a nature of all machine learning is the overtraining problem, and I'm not going to get too into that. That's sort of a, a 102 talk on how do you avoid uh, convergence and, and overtraining, but it's an important thing to be aware of. So we use statistics and AI. Statistics is the buns, AI is the meat. We use statistics for finding the relationships and we use AI for building the models, and then we use statistics again for testing the relationships to validate what we uh, thought worked. Uh, statistics makes intractable analysis tractable. Uh, pairwise comparison of a thousand stocks, a thousand factors, you end up with a, a million univariate relationships, and then you go to multivariate, you end up with exponential growth. In a perfect world, we would just use an AI system, and we would not need the statistics layer, but we use statistics to pare down the problem. So, Risks in internet sentiment data, all internet networks are growing, so they must be normalized. Uh, this is a very important one. Uh, data tends to be not stationary. Uh, the, a lot of broken time series in internet data. So, you know, it's very common to, you know, think you have a relationship and you find out there's a broken time series in your data. So that all has to be vetted. Starch effects. Seasonality is big. Uh, people use the internet less during the summer, for example. And sentiment connotations change. Uh, now, this is one that the machine learning should catch over time, but over, if it changes rapidly, like dot-com or subprime mortgage is the other example. Subprime up to 2007 was actually a pretty good thing. And then after 2007, it became like, whoa, that's totally negative. So uh, a little common sense there helps a lot. So let me get into real quick what Alpha Genius does. We trade 30 to 100 models. Uh, we pick our models based on uh, different asset classes with low correlations to each other. Uh, each model has hundreds of input variables, so it's not relying on a few factors. 
uh, statistical risk calculations to tell us how each model should perform. So if one model kind of starts going off the rails, we'll, we'll sidetrack it. Um, the machine learning is retrained quarterly to incorporate new data, and we're constantly feeding in new data sources. You know, we're, we, we, we would admire it to be like a renaissance technology, and that we're trying to find as many orthogonal data sources to feed into this uh, machine learning system. Uh, our particular uh, angle being, uh, sentiment being probably our, our strong point. And a large number of uh, models reduces difficult to measure risks such as selection bias, survivorship bias. So for example, we'll, we just trade the entire Dow 30. You know, so there's a whole thing like, well, why don't you, you maybe you're just picking your winners. Well, we're not picking our winners, we're just trading the whole Dow 30 as one of our criteria. Again, we picked that just because we wanted to avoid the, the so-called selection bias and survivorship bias. So the big punchline, does it work? Uh, and our back testing, it worked really well. 50% alpha. Now, I will say that that was largely driven off 2008, where we had in our back testing like a 130% year. Now, the way we do our back testing is we'll train with, a, with about half our data, then we'll use about a quarter of our data for cross validation, and then we'll use a quarter of our data for a test. Uh, so th those results, you know, I mean, you know, again, on a typical year, we'll expect to do you know 15 to 40% return. Uh, very low correlation to the overall market, interestingly enough. Uh, and and, and it also interesting fact, a lot of our models aren't even correlated to each other, even though they're all based on sentiment, just a side note. Uh, it seems to do better during highly volatile times, like a lot of quant strategies. Uh, we started tra uh, trading uh, live money last September, and we've done just over 20% since September of uh, 2011. So that's kind of right in line of what our back testing would expect. Um, and that wraps it up. If anybody has questions, there's my email. You want to? I think we have time for a few questions. So um, I'm familiar with. Uh, I'm wondering how you get the data. So um, I know that Google has like an analytics package. Does Twitter also allow you to get them, or do you have dedicated users of Twitter that share data with you? Yeah, you know. So we, we talk about almost everything in, in great detail except our data sources. So. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, there's a kind of a, a dirty secret in machine learning that you can solve the problem with a lot of different machine learning algorithms. It's the data that's the key. I'll put it to you this way. It's all out there on the internet. You know, most of everything we have is, is, is out there. It's just hard to collect, it's hard to normalize, and there's, a, and there's a decaying factor. So remember, we've been collecting this data from, you know, 2005, 2006, and things tend to decay on the internet. So if you haven't collected some data, it's just gone. And then other companies sell the data. I mean, you can go to a company like a Gnip and buy Twitter data, for example. And then uh, follow-up question is, how short are your trades? What, what's the duration of your trades? Yeah, one day to one week. Uh, which again, we picked that because that was in line with uh, Tetlock's research. Well, you said, you said using hundreds of people's variables, right? That sounds quite a lot of variables. Uh, in order to, to protect you against overfitting. So you it's difficult to do something special there. To, to defend against overfitting? Well, I mean, you know, all the regular machine learning stuff, regularization, and uh, that's correct. You know, the key is that, you know, we're, we're testing it all out of sample, you know, so, you know, the overfitting, I think, is, is definitely something we're concerned about, but nothing about our data is, you know, in the results, like, you know, it's, we're not feeding back any of the results at all. So, um, you know, the, the proof's in the sort of the, the back testing to some degree. I mean, you know, you use the regularization and whatnot to make sure you're not overtrained. Unfortunately, when you have this many factors, you can't put it on a plot and say, oh, you know, it converges nicely or it doesn't converge nicely. So, questions? So, uh, I think it's really exciting to see it's actually going to be mine for the Are these numbers in back yeah, yeah, these are back tested, and we do have, we, like I said, we've done about 20% since uh, September 1st last year is when we started trading uh, live money, about $4 million. Uh, $3 million is our own money, so in case people question, we believe into it, and we obviously believe in it. Um, yeah, sharp ratios. It's going to be in line. I mean, it's such a short time period that I didn't bother to put the live trading uh, statistics, but it's, it's in line here. You know, it's very, you know, it tends to be fairly low volatility. It tends to do much better during. Uh, uh, high volatility markets. So we kind of have the opposite problem that Emmanuel was describing. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's such a new field that we're kind of learning as we go of, of what it, uh, is important to, to really take a statistic on. Yeah. So, go ahead. All right. Um, do you, uh, so many think you look at um, sentiment about the stock, or do you look at things, fundamental things like product launches? 
Yeah, that's a great question. We do both. We do both. Um, and you know, I think that you, what you'll find is, you know, I like the uh, you know one of the earlier speakers. I think what you'll find with sentiment is that there's going to be a lot of people doing what we're doing, coming at completely different angles. And I don't think our stuff's even going to correlate very much with each other. Uh, so we do both. We'll look at the stock tickers. If people are talking about stock tickers. If people are talking about products, if people are talking about the economy, people are talking about their happiness. It, 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 we kind of the, the benefit of machine learning is if you do it well and you can kind of avoid the overtraining problems, you can really throw the kitchen sink at it. Sorry, who, who was next? So you have some models. Let's say the sharp ratio three, and it'll have a sharp ratio three forever because it's, that's how good it is. Let's just say that's representative. Do you have a sense for? I mean, clearly you haven't squeezed all the juice out of the data. Yeah. And it's a very difficult problem. Do you have a sense for if you had you know, three more years or four more years and infinite computer time and you said, okay, I'm finished. There's no more in here. I looked everywhere and this is how good, this is how much information exists in these social networks. Do you have a, do you have a feel for how much better you think this particular model can get? No, I, I don't. I don't have any, uh, any idea. I mean, so we're, we're kind of at the point now where you know, we like the characteristics of it, that the returns are good and it's not correlated to anything. We kind of see it as its own asset class. There's a high skepticism wall we're climbing right now. So, you know, in terms of like where it could get, I don't know, but we're definitely squeezing both ends. We're squeezing the machine learning and we're squeezing the data sources. So there's a lot of juice left in here. You, you mentioned 2008 having spectacular returns. In back testing, yes. With back tested. How, do, how, do, how does it work in like a major inflection type of environment, like March of 2009 as an example? Yeah, I mean, every one of the years in back testing were good. I mean, so they were all, you know, in the 20% plus uh, return range. So I don't know exactly the moment you're speaking about, uh, but our live trading in September 1st was a pretty big V uh, right out the chute. So we did pretty well during that. You know, the market kind of took a big old no nosedive and then came back out. And, Seem to be catching the, the sentiment pretty well on that. Um, we can take one last question. What's the average lifetime of a model? Well, I don't know yet. I mean, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I really have no no way of knowing because these models are never done. You know, we're always adding and t we're even taking out. We will take out uh, indexes too. So, like, you know, there's a there's a bit of a uh, the best survive. Uh, uh, Type thing. So if we find some indexes, and again, to avoid the convergence problems, sometimes we'll decide, and this index isn't contributing enough, and this new data source is powerful. So I don't know what the lifetime is. Great. Thank you very much.